Any other questions on this, or? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, no shortcut to it. It's just a lot of content because we're trying to do an integrated design process that just has a lot of elements. But let's talk about a couple of practical things. So one, safety. So that torch stuff. So let's talk about uh, cylinders, gas cylinders. They're high pressure. They're 2,000 PSI, which means that if it falls over and the top gets knocked off, it becomes a torpedo. I mean, literally, like, if that happened, like, in the middle of a stadium, the thing would fly a over the stadium and stuff like that. It can be very, very, uh, it's very energetic. The amount of pressure and force that's stored up when you have this gas that's at 2,000 PSI, it's 100 times that of more than 100, like 150 atmospheres, but it's really, really powerful. So the thing is about the tanks, they're on carts, but they're chained up together, so they can't fall apart. Or if they fall, like the whole thing has to fall, it makes it much harder to knock off the the actual fittings that are on it but if you knock off the top like you're going to get a massive if you actually knock off the fitting that's at the top like the the knob you can have a very dangerous situation the thing will like just destroy the whole workshop just fly through it like a torpedo i mean it's serious it's serious stuff um so like i noticed you exchange the tank you got to put it on a cart and put the chain around it so the likelihood of it just tipping over and breaking off a fitting i mean if it just drops over lands in a bad way and hits something it could knock that fitting like right off it's like Can we put them inside of a, a structure to prevent that um like rebar structures anything well i mean it it's like literally think of a torpedo i mean but there's ones that we move around you have to move them around because the torch is portable so the the standard practice is if you move in the tank you got to screw on the top if it lands the way the top is designed, that, that cover cap, not the knob that you actually turn it on, but the cover cap, this little cylinder thing that goes on the shroud over the top, if you fall over, that, that thing doesn't come off. It's, it's quite safe. Uh, but if we're moving a single bottle, you got to keep that on. Don't, um, don't move a cylinder, a full cylinder that's uh, got the top, the, the knob actually exposed. Because that's it's like a three-quarter inch fitting or whatever it's pretty thin up there you can knock it off and cause a very dangerous situation on the carts <laughs> but you got that new one out there that's not sitting on a cart so if someone knocks it over right now but the one so how are you cutting if they're both empty oh oh so you picked up one that was empty Oh. Maybe, uh, the gauge is working on this or it's actually you know, okay. the Yeah. Like, we should have like I think there's another full the ones that are full are in um west yeah. back. Not by the entrance but more like in the corner. But yeah, it's just a safety thing. Uh standard is the chain around it, uh, bonding the two bottles together so it's much harder for them to fall off. And in the cart there it's a little more stable. But also on the welders there's a chain around the welder bottle, gas bottle. Make sure that's on and not like don't hang the chain where it's like a, got a bunch of slop because it could still possibly fall over. It'll get it tight so that the chain is hugging right against the bottle. So if you like tip, it's just much harder for it to fall over. Yeah, uh, that's one thing. Let's talk about um, the very important topic. Just to practice in, in the workshop. If you put in the, just notes in the critical path. Doc, how do you cut steel and what tools what tools are usable for cutting steel because there's like so many different ways to cut things whether it's wood steel or other materials but let's let's do a survey of that real quick just just to appreciate some of the subtleties there because um, there's just so many ways to do it so, so this is like I started thinking okay uh, well let's so I started okay how do you drill a hole or cut a thing and then turned out into this 40 item list so because there's really a lot of a lot of ways you can do it so Wait, did you just remove? Oh, no we gotta uh, enlarge that thing okay tool use cutting steel and holes so first you have to consider what kind of material you're cutting in terms of profile whether it's solid or hollow so solid 
solid, hollow, thick, thin, irregular, because you're gonna do different tooling for whatever geometry you have. And you have to understand that as a, from the get-go. Um, the tools available are iron worker hole puncher. So for, first with the iron worker, where to use the iron, iron worker. And here you can do like a whole, uh, like a two-dimensional chart showing like material thickness uh, or like shape versus like what's the ideal tool to use and you get clusters of, and you'll see like but you have to un have this whole picture of okay if I want to do something like a cut of some sort which is the first thing I turn to and what's the capacity including safety speed cleanness precision and all that okay so what's an iron worker good for what kind of so talking about solid how thick thin irregular what what can we do with the iron worker what's it good for like say you got some steel to cut is your first choice the iron worker? Uh, flat. Flats and thick. Uh, what about flat and thin? Like quarter inch. How precise is it? Is the iron worker? It's pretty. It's pretty precise. It's pretty right on. Because uh, the blade gap is only like a, like seven thousandths or so. It's so you get a pretty clean cut. Um, so say you want to cut. Uh, what we'll kind of plates for the torch table? They're quarter inch. What would be our first choice? Will we use the iron worker. So we got um, we got 12, 12 inch wide stock. How would we cut it? For flat for the the carriage metal piece. Oh no, not not for the blades, but for the torch table, the actual carriages of the universal axis, just the flat pieces. Oh, I thought you said for the blades. Oh, sorry. Iron worker. What would be your next tool? Like, say the iron worker was out, we the power cube ran out of gas. Where, where do you go? Add another power cube. You could do another power cube. In which case would you do it? Versus, okay, I gotta um, drive life track back in. At what point would you say, I'm going to get uh, the other power cube versus, nah, I'm just going to do this other thing. What's your next best choice? Uh, angle grinder. Angle grinder. For a quarter that inch? No, not, not angle grinder. Angle grinder at most you'd ever do is like eighth, but not for long linear cuts. You can do the cutting blade on a on an angle grinder that's the thin one, but it's slow and you can't the danger is if you torque it like you can get the blade stuck. If you don't go vertically down, you torque that, it'll just rip and possibly injure you. The blade will shatter. It's an for safety wise, I don't like using the cutoff wheel on angle grinders. Cause if you're doing a thin precision hole and you torque it, you're going to catch your blade. Uh, I see a lot of people gravitating towards the cutoff wheel. Like I'd like to see that thing like almost never used. Um, safety reasons. If you're going to do a cut of something, just take it right on an abrasive cutoff. The 14 inch abrasive cutoff wheel. That's safe because you can clamp the object. Um, for the abrasive cutoff, you have to hold that thing. That That thing can move if you catch the blade that's the real danger of it try not to use the cutoff i i never use it because of that i mean unless you're paying attention the whole time it's a dangerous tool so um hole puncher thick metal up to one inch we we sheared the one inch for what oh yeah for the counterweights for the and it could hardly cut one by 12. uh i had to just keep going back and forth to cut it um, but yes for quarter inch yes definitely not grinder for quarter inch um, angles too iron worker does angles quick way to do angles okay hacksaw um, what's the limit of a hacksaw um, yeah well okay let's let's kill off so uh, I think we didn't never got to will we take out live track or use the torch at which point 
um, the torch, I mean, that could be pretty quick. Say you had to cut that, cut that out of, like, say, 12-inch stock. You have to cut 12 inches across. It's pretty fast, but what's the disadvantage of that? You got all this cleanup at the end. It's, it's as straight as you can run with your hand against the guide. Um, but you can definitely do that. You can definitely do it. It's fast. Grinder, no. Uh, circular blades. There are metal cutting circular blades. There's a thing called a cold saw, which is like the abrasive cutoff saw, but it's a slow moving metal blade and it's water cooled, like liquid cooled. Um, we actually have one, but we hardly ever use it. Uh, it's not really set up. Uh, okay, hacksaw. Can you cut, like, would you ever cut a uh, one inch rod with a hacksaw? Yeah. How long would it take? If you like really get into it with a hacksaw, maybe like five minutes of non-stop. But it's very tiring. I think you could do it in four. <laughs> <laughs> Alright. So how would you... So how would you cut a one-inch shaft? With the... Um, what do you call it? The abrasive cut-off? Abrasive cut-off, that's the best. Uh, what about two-inch shaft? Would you take that on abrasive cut-off? Which one would be abrasive cut-off? So the one with the 14-inch grinder wheel. Yeah, the thing that you go like that, that sparks. It's one of these. Yeah. What's the limit of this thing? Before it gets unpractical. Practical range of that is like quarter inch. Once you start getting into like half inch, like half inch plate, yeah, you can do it. It's much slower. Quarter inch, yeah, you could still do it. You can still cut your quarter inch tubing. Half inch tubing, man, that would take forever. So you that's why you're doing that all with a torch. Can't do it on an iron worker. Hacksaw, you can do it. It'll take you all day probably to make one cut. But, I mean, the hacksaw is actually very powerful. It's a, it would be a great hazing exercise for students. <laughs> no, I mean, but it does work. It completely, it's the slow version of a reciprocating saw. So if you put a metal blade on a reciprocating saw, cordless, so this, what's really nice, I would say, cordless reciprocating this is an advanced hacksaw like one of these things if you use a metal blade can you do like a one inch shaft yeah you can. with a metal blade it'll take you like a minute if you have to but it's it's kind of hard work you have to hold it so abrasive cutoff would be easiest you can definitely torch it one inch easy but you got to clean it up so always like between choose like Mainly it's iron worker, torch, abrasive cutoff, grinder, hacksaw, depending on what you got. But for the for the one inch rod, I mean you need clean ends, like say for the axes. What's the other disadvantage of the torch on a one inch rod? It will warp it out, I mean. So you gotta grind it down definitely, like if you try to cut thin plate with a torch, it'll warp it up unless you have a water bed like on a torch table. So how would you cut, okay, let's cut thin metal, 16th inch, um, best way to do it. Angle grinder cutting blade, yes, dangerous, uh, you gotta watch it, easy to bind up once again, not recommended. I would actually do a, a diamond, a metal cutting blade on a circular saw, that actually works really well. Uh, so circular saw with metal blade and you can like Google YouTube like if you there's probably gonna be creative ways to do many different things if you don't have the right tool but there's better and worse things to do but actually the circular saw with metal blade great on thin steel and what does a metal blade look like there's two types one metal blade could have the regular teeth, which is just really hardened steel, or it could be the diamond, diamond style slotted blade. Okay, so let's look at blades. How do you recognize one? That's that is what you would use. Okay. 
ferrous metal blade works great doesn't really dull down you can keep cutting it just shakes off with those little yeah openings. it's not got teeth teeth would catch and rip it very hard so you'd have to have small teeth on another type of blade so this would be great say we're making a um, bottom of the blade for the d3d universe bottom of the blade bottom of the plate the heated plate the thin plate on the bottom which is actually 16th inch this what else can you do you can do the iron worker um, yeah it could probably work but it might bend the edge a little bit because if it's so thin it might end up bending your piece this doesn't bend anything it's kind of a it leaves sharp marks on the metal but doesn't heat it up too much it works well so what's the limit of a thing like this Eighth, if you go, it gets starts getting a little tiring on eighth because it's it's pretty slow. Is Definitely. Depending on the, on the sort of torque or power of your machine is using, or is there is there a strict like ranking? Um, so for eighth, think about this is heat with a thin metal. You don't build up enough heat in this blade here uh, before you cut it. Um, heat build up. So once you go above an eighth inch the metal will get so hot that this blade will get so hot and will you'll crush it won't cut, it won't cut anymore I let's stuff like this for like angle iron or like uh, I what stuff is how thick eighth inch or quarter probably like eight. yeah yeah but like if you're doing like heating mounting and stuff like that the rail is going to be like that these the larger they are you can cut more ambitious stuff up to like a quarter if you have a big one so let's look at so that's like a held handheld relatively small one they have ones like this they are huge we have one of those it's called let's see what comes up for a quickie saw they call it these ones so this will cut quarter inch steel tubing uh, that may not be the right blade. The I would do something like this is gas powered heavy equipment kind of stuff. Cut con like these are like all purpose like concrete, metal, like demolition blades. But there's a difference between uh, the concrete cutting blade. These are all like diamond tipped ones and metal blade. Let's look at that metal yeah they're pretty powerful tools um, like for example someone came out here with this saw like I would be torching like early life track tractors we use four inch tubing quarter inch wall I was used to typically doing that with a torch they had one of these and they showed me like wow I couldn't believe this thing cuts like that you can cut up like through cars and metal and whatever you got. These things do that. Um, Looks like a robot arm. <laughs> yeah, put that on there. So let's look at a difference. So in a blade repo that we have, there's slitted blades like that and you have to be able to determine which is one for metal versus concrete. Because the ones that work on concrete, like the metal ones would tend to dull on concrete quite a bit. They're not really interchangeable so metal versus concrete diamond blade what's the difference how can you tell um, so if you look at the ones that have plain slits in them I believe they're the ones for metal and how do you logic that out because there's ones that have the plain slits like this one and there's ones that have more like these bumps on the side they look similar so which does what that one looks like the concrete. how do you tell well, by the way the hardness of the concrete is less than a metal you wouldn't really need those sort of flat slots you would more abrasive so something that sort of mm -hmm. Yeah, so actually those on the edge here, these are more like bumps and they kind of like smash through the concrete. 
So that's how you tell. Basically, the slitted ones are typically metal, and the ones with the bumps on the side, they're actually like little, very small protrusions that basically like shatter the concrete. Okay. Yeah, and you'll have combo combination style things like one that might have both slits and uh, bumps. Okay, what about this one? What does this style do? And we have one of these if you look look at it. This one is for a very aggressive grinding of concrete. Like say you do a foundation, you got like big bumps, this cuts right through them. Uh, so this is an aggressive concrete cutting where, where you're flattening out. Say you got an uneven foundation, you actually take out high spots very quickly, like uneven uneven sidewalk, like, like tripping hazard, yeah, just cut that right down with these type of blades. Is that flat, like on the ground? Yeah, so you do it like flat, like like a grinder, you would grind flat. Like that will be way more aggressive than you need to get out bumps like this. It will be more like, for this, you'd need more like a buffer, which is, uh, so what's a buffer blade look like? Because we do use buffer blades, diamond polishing blades. There's a difference between this is not a polishing blade. This is an aggressive grinding blade. So diamond polishing blade looks different. And they're actually called pads. But what they have is a plastic material. This is where, what you do for like polished concrete, which is really smooth. They're plastic matrix with little diamonds, diamond powder in it. So for example, if you wanted to take this little in inaccuracy or like smooth that down, you could do it with these kinds of blades. Uh, just saying. Do you think that'd be helpful for like the CD go home foundation? So flat, um, these are, no, we lost it. Like the places where it's really flat right now, the sm smooth shiny parts, if you take these, it will make it shine completely, yeah. But the parts where it's like we got those joints where it's like a little uneven by like visible amount. No, they're, you'll wear these out too fast. So what was the solution to get the foundation? Well, the solution for there would be a two-step process. You can do, you'd be able to do this one to take out the right. unevenness and then you'd have to go back to polishing. This would get you the rough Roughness out. Next one will be I'd be worried polishing. that I go too, like grind too much in a single it's, spot. Yes, this is not not amateur work. You'd have to have skill because you're freehand. If you're freehand, unless you have a machine that like kind of self levels, but by hand this would be very hard. So this is that's why polished concrete is pretty expensive. Uh, the but they still have. Hmm? Not the <laughs> yeah. Okay. Back to some more cuts like. Um, Critical thing about the abrasive cutoff is that you got to hold the workpiece down. You can do things like you notice, like how would I cut the, how did I cut the bolts with a slid down them? How did I do that's, that? That's what I wanted to ask. Yeah, how did I do that? You got to hold it. You can't do any cutting without holding things down. Like if you were to try to hold it, I mean, you got to hold it somehow. Freehand, don't do that with a slitting blade. Once again, very the deeper the cut is, the easier it is for your blade to bind. And you have to, a lot of times you, with a grinder, you have to pay attention. Like if you're grinding in, in say like you, you're inside the tube or something, or inside the larger tube with a large blade, uh, be careful about binding or like where one side kind of catches and the other side catches uh, dangerous stuff. Because the, the, the grinders there we have are 5, 9, or 15 amps. The 15 amp has got a lot of force. The 5 amp one, if you completely bind up, uh, it'll shake you around. The 15 amp is going to be, can throw you around. Uh, so dangerous. It's a f fast spinning blade. The, the abrasive works by spinning really fast. That's how all the sparks fly. So those things are like 10,000 RPM for the small ones. For the large grinders, maybe they're like 5,000 RPM. Uh, typically faster than a regular cutoff, so which is like 3,600 RPM. How do you get 3600? It's 60 hertz. It, it's by the type of motor. The typical number there is 60 hertz, which means 60 per second. 
which means 3,600 per minute. So a typical, if you think about the numbers there, 3,600 is pretty fast. That's what you cut wood with. Uh, slower than that, and you have things like the, the cold cut metal saw, which looks like a regular blade. It's got real teeth, uh, but it moves very slowly, so each tooth only takes out so much, and the teeth are pretty small. Um, cold cut, just so you recognize a cold cut saw blade. They're like this. They're pretty small teeth. The blade itself is relatively thick, and you have to put a lot of force on it. Slow moving, like maybe like a hundred RPM or something. It's just slow. It goes like that. Uh, that fast, you can see it move. Okay, what else to cover about tools? Um, hollow. Okay, bandsaw. What can you do on a bandsaw? What's the limit of a bandsaw? It's good for solid solids, but for narrow wall stuff, the principle is you gotta have a few teeth on the metal at all times, otherwise the teeth will just rip right out. So if you do a thin tube, like, like say quarter inch tube, you wanna have several teeth, so the teeth have to be very fine, like a hacksaw for that blade to work effectively. The, the big bandsaw we have, some have teeth that are you know, like a quarter inch apart. That would rip the teeth right out because you want to have multiple teeth riding on the metal that you're cutting at all times. That's why solids are okay because you then you're going to ride a lot of teeth on the on a solid, whereas a hollow, thin-walled thing like, say, electromechanical tubing, like conduit tubing, will rip the teeth right out of a bandsaw. So no thin stuff on a bandsaw. Um, annular cutter versus drill press. So we talked about, we got annular cutters. So that's the difference. What's a regular drill bit versus annular cutter? So that's the mag drills. Annular cutters, those are those annular cutter bits. They have a hollow inside. They also have a pin that's a centering pin. So when you start one of these holes, you have to start against metal. You cannot drill a hole that's been already drilled partly. Like if you're trying to take drill upon a quarter inch hole with this say one inch blade one inch uh, annular cutter um, there's a pin that's inside there that has to touch the metal so it doesn't shift around when it starts so you cannot use this to enlarge an existing hole new holes only you have to do that against metal um, compared to would you drill with this for a one inch hole like say you had the mag drill one inch hole what's advantage disadvantage use this versus a solid regular drill bit what's the advantage and disadvantage of this less to cut right less to cut because it's an annual cutter it's just got that circular area it's faster way faster it's like a hole saw for metal. yeah it's a hole saw for metal except it's a it can drill much more heavy metal than a hole saw for metal but yes holes did mention hole saws but yes yeah, hole saws uh, can be used for metal have metal in the center for that to cut. Yep. So the, the con is you can't use it to enlarge already existing holes. Yep. So I thought yesterday you were telling me I needed to use the annular cutter to enlarge the holes. No, maybe m miscommunication. Um, you'd have to start a new hole. Yeah. Definitely. The, the big drill, the regular drill bit to enlarge. <coughs> Oh, because I didn't know you started. Uh, I thought you were starting with that bit as opposed to enlarging an existing hole. Okay. Yeah, because if you were starting that hole. That yes, okay. yes, yes. And I okay. missed that you already had holes yeah. in there. <laughs> I was very confused. I was okay. Like, I'm pretty sure I can enlarge this hole with this bit. <laughs> yeah. Right, yeah. This right. okay. Well, what if you put another piece of metal underneath the hole? You want to turn around? that work then the the center thing mm. could go down to the to the to maybe the if it was the whole the metal was thin enough if that pin in the middle the pin only sticks out so much so you would have to reach it 
Um, yeah. When you remount a hull from smaller size to larger size, what's the practical limit where you can drill holes with a good good drill bit by hand versus you want to put it on some kind of a press, whether a drill press or a mag drill? And what's the limit of a really heavy drilling device? So, question one. Um, what can you do comfortably by hand in terms of a drill bit? Because not annual cutters. Annual cutters have high torque, that's why those motors are slow and geared down. Uh, for safety, the other thing I forgot to mention, no gloves when doing that because they, they'll bind up and rip your fingers off pretty easily because it's a high torque machine. The annular cutter is more um, dangerous tool that we're using, right? most dangerous tool that we're using right now perhaps uh, outside the grinders. Uh, the cordless drills don't really have enough torque to do too much damage, but I mean they still can. But um, I mean, you still don't want to be wearing heavy gloves, perhaps if you're doing high, like big bits. Okay, but the question is, what's really easy and safe to do by hand, versus it's like, oh man, it's just too hard. And what? Yeah. And also, the second question is going to be why. But uh, what's the limit by hand? Yeah, I'd say that. My experience on a quarter inch with a new bit, you can drill right through that with a cordless drill. Yeah. The cordless. Bigger than one quarter, don't don't try it too hard. So what happens if you do try it and you don't have enough? First of all, it takes a lot of strength. You have to press down hard. So, but you can do it with a quarter inch by putting it on a table and leaning into it with your body. That's quite easy. What if you don't have enough strength, and that's why a drill press is used. It's a press because it's, it's actually got a lever that multiplies your force going down. So what happens if you don't press hard enough and you're trying to drill a hole? Heat. So what does heat do to metal? Makes one saw... So it can make things soft and can can make things hard depending on the composition of the, <coughs> of the metal so on the drill bit side do you want heat on a drill bit no. no it'll get soft it will weaker like with heat you get weaker after you cool you get harder so one you're gonna do your bit but what also happens to that metal and you I don't know if you've noticed this. Do you ever notice that you cut so slow that now the metal got so hard and you can't even drill with a good bit? That was metal hardening. So if you don't have enough force down, if you're not cutting that hole and you don't see the nice slivers of metal coming out, because they release heat too. That's they're hot and they fly off. If you keep drilling in there, it's like starting a fire with your rubbing sticks. That's what's happening there. So if you don't go through the hole fast enough, you're going to destroy the bit, make the metal harder, possibly make that hole undrillable because it gets uh, heat hardened. I've seen it happen on abrasive cutoff where if you get too thick metal, like half inch or even quarter against the flat surface. So the technique for um, even quarter, even one eighth on abrasive cutoff always use a corner to start on don't use the flat side because then the blade has got all that surface to go against so it doesn't even see that it's one six one eighth thick it, it for all it matters it, it's seeing that it's got a solid surface it could be an inch thick because the blade is very shallow so you always want to cut on a on an edge so if you've got a tube don't start trying to cut it like on a on a flat maybe uh maybe do it like that so you're cutting the edge just be careful like when when you're cutting down don't end up where the blade ends up perfectly flat on a flat surface because the cut area is really large 
and it doesn't have enough strength to do it. What will happen then is you'll just heat harden it and you'll find that you can't even cut through with a blade anymore. It'll actually wear out the blade before it starts cutting. Did you guys have, have that happen? No. <coughs> it can. So you couldn't get it through and you probably hardened it. Yeah? No, I stopped this for that. I just noticed it wasn't cutting. Yeah. It's like I'm making an indentation of this, but this isn't getting, I'm not really making progress. It makes sense to make an actual. Yeah. So you definitely have to consider whatever you're doing, you have to think about it. Okay. If you see that the abrasive cutoff is not cutting, and it should be, like, stop a little bit, maybe, okay, is the motor weak? Am I actually hardening the steel because I'm cutting against a flat surface? Because good cutting should be good sparks on abrasive tools and on uh, bits, you should have clear shavings. Not those ones that turn, like, purple and hot looking or even potentially, like, glowing. <laughs> um, that's not good. You got to part of the heat dissipation is that you got the the shards coming off, releasing some of the heat. And lu water lubrication, like diesel, is great for, or even water, just for the annular cutters. Um, make sure that when you're going down, you're not going too fast, but fast enough that you get good cuttings. So that applies to both drill and you have to get a feeling for this, where on an abrasive cutoff, you can't press down too hard; you'll burn out the motor. You can't press too light, you'll go too slow and you'll, instead of cutting, you'll be warming it up and you'll harden it. So like good, you have to kind of think about what, get an understanding for what a good cutting rate is. Um, that you kind of maybe like watch some YouTube videos or just get experience. Like what you see is like, okay, that was a clean, good, fast cut. Um, knowing that like quarter inch, yes, you should be cutting readily um with the abrasive cutoff yeah and um with drill bits clean shavings if you get very tiny little things i mean something's dull you're kind of like rubbing against them making tiny particles come up because the way a drill bit works it, it's supposed to cut long slivers of the metal yeah okay what else so question how, so how did you how did i cut that yeah. So if you notice, that was a threaded bolt. So when you ha try to cut a threaded thing, note that you can put nuts on it. So what I did is was took a piece of metal that had a hole in it, and I put a nut on the top and bottom so I could hold that. Uh, it was a tube. I held the tube. I actually clamped the tube, and then the bolt was sticking up. It was through one of the hole tubes, or a plate. plate that was. Uh, I could put the, the bolt in vertically, put a nut on it, and now it was firmly held. So that I could cut down straight with the abrasive cutoff. I just put it in the vise of the abrasive cutoff saw. The metal I held in the vise of it. So yeah, that's the key to holding it. Uh, couldn't do that by hand. You can't hold it by hand because um, there's a lot of force on the cut. You do have to cut because it's. Ha Say again. Yeah, uh, strong pair of pliers. That was a three-quarter inch bolt, so that's like a lot. That's a lot. Uh, so, slow so, cut. So, you, yeah. so at that point, I had to watch out for. Okay, let me. I need to press down hard enough, so I'm not heating it, but instead really cutting. I had to pay attention to that, and otherwise have the hold very firm in the vise of the machine. Means you means you had to have some like extensions because the vise is. Yeah, I, I took a. A uh, half by four strip of the whole metal, metal with the holes. Mm -hmm. I put that and clamped it down with a vise, and then the bolt was right there, accessible. Yeah. Um, what else? Um, for torch, I mean, torches, like torches, good multi-purpose cutting. You can cut anything. Like uh, I cut the three-inch shaft with that. That was like the only tool you could do with that. You can put it, well, no, bandsaw. Bandsaw. Is, bandsaw would be the cleanest, but it would take more time than torching. Um, torching was okay, but it really messy cut. You got to grind it down at the end quite a bit, all kinds of slag, and you kind of got to rotate it as well. Um, 
a lot of slag with uh, acetylene torch. If you go to hydrogen, which is uh, that's something we got to start using here, but hydrogen torch torches don't have the slag problem nearly as much. Very clean cuts, and they could also do aluminum and other metals like stainless steel or copper. I think they cut through copper too. A setting torch doesn't cut well through, like you can't cut aluminum with it, or or copper, because no, it ends up melting and it it just does like this pretty much a molten channel instead of a cut. Yeah, because I think the aluminum for some, I don't know. It sounds, I don't know why, why can't why not. Yeah, it doesn't have a burn as fast. Why not aluminum with acetylene? If, because uh, aluminum oxyacetylene will get aluminum hot enough to melt away but no way for a neat matter it just melts it tends to melt it more than cut it it just doesn't work for some reason um, while the oxy hydrogen works better what else on cutting reciprocating saw there's on a reciprocating saws there's two types of blades wood blades with larger teeth the metal blades you can recognize they're very small teeth and they'll say something like metal blade on it uh, so yes you can actually cut metal with a reciprocating saw but make sure you would have the right blade on it like you know cutting nails and stuff like that yes we do have the what what about like is there an approach to this where um, like I guess like a more physics oriented or like is there some field that's like the intersection of, uh, like, there's like material science, right? You talk about like cutting metal and wood, but I'm in, I'd be interested in like knowing how I can, or like a more gen generic approach to cutting any, any material. Clamp it down. Don't get your fingers in the way. You have to consider it's about the strength, melting temperature, oxidizability uh, primarily like the materials properties you're talking about for metallics it's like uh, metallic versus stone or wood wood has fibers well, we're going to do like plastics right if we're 3d printing polyethylene and all sorts of things mm -hmm. yes yeah, like industrial industrial engineering so that was the undergrad at Yeah. Uh, the idea, biggest points are for if you've got thin material, thin thin teeth, small teeth, thick material, you can get larger teeth with flame. It doesn't matter. Like for irregular shapes, for cutting precise geometries, that's CNC. Obviously, by hand, you can only do so much by in terms of your how straight you can hold things. You can use templates. If you can lay something against the template, you can get down to like. Um, probably like an uh, maybe up to 16th inch accuracy because the the accuracy is that of template plus how straight you're holding the thing like if you hold it straight down for a torch versus you got it at a small angle um, there's there's cir circle cutting jigs for torches so if you want to cut like a big hole uh, there's a thing it's like a protractor thing where you lay the torch on a pivot and you and you kind of just move move it in a circle uh, so for a large hole because the question comes up a lot of times okay holes so yeah holes are common features and different things for that ideally you got CNC torch if we're making the plates right now for the carriages the ideal tool would be a CNC torch because we've got some elongated holes for adjustments how you do elongated holes that's hard that that's only like mill territory you'd have to mill it 
or what we did right now was we drill two holes next to each other torch out in between for a slit, slotted hole um, yeah did it work kind of works except for like the edges where it gets the edge might be a little come in a little more or something um, what else there's on a lathe meaning a thing that spins something like if you have your drill or a you know cordless drill you can hold a rod and if you hold some kind of a grinder or cutting tool against it you, you can cut things that way too they have like cut off uh, cut off blades like on a lathe a thin knife like structure that you poke it into the material and it and it cuts it and shaves it off. Um, for grinders, we uh, the difference between an, another wheel, there's buffing wheels and there's grinding wheels. Uh, buffing wheels are the ones that kind of have like the flaps or the pads on them, which are used for polishing things, not so much grinding. Um, buffing wheel grinder. Yeah, uh, drill bits. Yeah, so how do you do that? Let's talk about that for a sec. Um, so buffing. These kinds of things. That's a buffing wheel. It's pretty much got sandpaper-like material. Don't use that to grind stuff. You'll just wear that right out. But this is good, like, say you want to get rust off or to polish, shine something up a little. Um, so we have some of these. Uh, don't confuse them with regular grinder wheels. Grinder wheels use the fat ones. Uh, try not to use the cutoff grinder wheels, as I mentioned, for safety reasons. Uh, I mean, it's the safest if you've got like really thin material. Yeah, you can cut off with a cutting wheel. I, I don't like it in general because I just put on a on a cutoff saw, the abrasive cutoff. Um, so on a lathe, how do you, so the CNC lathe concept, that's how you'd get a, okay, so how do you get super precise, so there's milling and there's grinding, so where do you do, or what are the limits of high force machining, which is drilling, milling, lathing, versus grinding, how do you actually get the most precise features, and the answer is grinding, actually. So a drill bit would not be made by um, machining it. You might you might start, but for the precision you want a grinder. Why? So why a grinder? So if you want a grinder, hmm? force, amount of force. So what do we say about grinder wheels? About their speed. High speed. High speed. Higher, higher PM means you need less force to do an action. With the machine cutting tools, they're hard contact one thing against another. Think about how much force it takes you to drill a hole in metal. A lot of force, contact machining. So if you want the super, super precision, you're going to end up with grinding. So say you want to do a drill bit, you might preform it to like a shape, maybe like with the flutes in there even by like twisting a piece of metal but how do you get that sharp edge that would be grinding there um, and why is that because the drill bit at the end of the day wants to be made of hardened material or hardenable material so first of all the machining would not work well because you're working on hard material and then for precise features they're very sharp you want the least force possible because once you go against something especially if it's like a long tube that's your drill bit you know, you have to support it very hard in order to machine it heavily. But how do you do like a very tiny drill bit? Well, you can't, you break it. So the only way you could do that kind of stuff is grinders. So the limit of grinders is uh, air bearings. So smooth that just the friction between two surfaces serves enough to trap air in there for a completely smooth glide. Um, so 
there is an open source air, bear, air bearing lathe. Look at this. This is it. So what, what you do for super high precision, if you want to get engines and like cylinders and oilless engines, rocket engines, this is what you get up to. And that is, that looks like a, like a lathe there, but, um, and that, that is, but. Is the lathe DIY? Uh, yeah, part, let's see, the. He, this guy actually built built this thing, um, but yeah. So actually, this is Dan Gelbart. He does this crazy uh, high tech machining stuff. But what do you do for an air bearing lathe? You have a grinder as the active tool, so you can be doing using that lathe. But the thing working on it is not the tool bit, but a grinder. So that's the territory of CNC grinding, which gets you such precision that when you make, I think he shows it at the end. Um, the grinder part is that tube there, that thing. Uh, yeah, watch this video later, but um, he shows the product of it. No, no, what am I saying here? It's not in this video. Does a um, grinding wheel do the thickness? That's a big, so that's like a... So you wouldn't mm. want the circumference of the disc to diminish too quickly, because then your CNC is off, right? Like using abrasive discs, they will eventually wear down. They wear down, and that's the other challenge with those. you got to even them out or use new ones after some time, because they will wear down. Yeah, so you or, can... Yeah. <clears throat> but here... In this video, take a look at that, it's quite instructive. Two cylinders, so, so you make one cylinder and a pin that goes inside of it. And because of the precision, no oil, no nothing, he spun that and the thing free spins forever. That's called air bearings. And that's what's used in super high, fast rotating things like jet engines. You can't have ball bearings in things like jet engines. It's, it's just air gliding against air. And that's how you do oilless engines. That's like the next level of beyond internal combustion engines of today. Uh, ain't happening. It's, nobody's industry's not going to do that. That disrupts an entire civilization. Yeah. So, oh, uh, we should do this. Oh, <laughs> Right. Exactly. So the hydrogen economy comes at the cost of access to this technology, but it's doable. It's called grinders and lathes. And how do you get the super precision surfaces to move on, right? We've done our torch table, not that precision. How do you get down to like one micron flatness? And that's actually very common already in tile, that industry. Uh, so the most advanced, this example here, how do you get the, the super precision motion? It's on a granite, it's granite. Granite slab, it's super precise, super flat. Really? Yep. So, um, well, so people make marble walls and granite, like marble. That technology they used to polish is super, super smooth. It's lapping. But that technology has been around for a long time because you have smooth marble for a long time. Uh, but those things are like super precise. So the way to make one of these air bearing lathes is you get a granite uh, for CNC. You get these blocks of granite 
this is what you do. You want to make air bearings, you start with this. Go to Amazon, get a $200 block of surface plate. It's going to have different grades. I don't know what they mean. I haven't looked into this too much, but these are going to be super precision pieces of rock. What's the most expensive one? What's the 1200 pound one? Um, on the plus. Yeah. 48 inch by 36 by 6 inch. So it's still tiny, but it's quite long. Oh, no, no, that's that's big. That Wow, that's a big chunk. 40 by 36 by 6 inch thick? Oh, yeah. That's going to be like a ton of weight or something. But it's not that expensive to get like capacity to make jet engines for $1,000. It's not too bad. What kind of bit do you use in granite? Hmm? What kind of drill do you use in granite? It's not drill. It's, oh, yeah. Well, you got to do like basically like, like diamond cutting. So Can we, we didn't talk about the foundation. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we could. It would be quite expensive. <laughs> uh, tile, uh, tile saw. This is like tile saws. <coughs> well, so once again, you use the. That's not precision cutting, but how do you do this? How is granite smooth? How is granite cut? It's lapping. It's like. Um, yeah. no, it's a different technology, but it is where it's like, it's called lapping. If you take two surfaces, keep rubbing them against each other, they actually end up wearing out to perfect smoothness. Um, so there, there's a whole technology, but that's well established and you can get these, I mean, that block of granite, it's not like 10,000 bucks, but a huge, I mean, that's like a four by, it's like, like a four by four Freight by boxes. six inch. Freight, Freight is going to be quite a bit on that. <laughs> Probably. Um, it's like shipping out of northern India or something. Not. We're not going to buy that right now. Um, <laughs> no, it wouldn't be. It wouldn't be free delivery. But it's an, actually not bad. Like, you know, six by eight inch by two inch for that super level of precision down to like, like a micron, which is one tenth of like one. Or a micron is. 25 microns are one thousandth of an inch, so down to one micron is like one twenty-fifth of one thousandth of an inch. But that's really available. That's the good news. So this you can do stock. This. stock. Uh, they use it for applications like machines that require super precision, like whatever, in space tech, maybe semiconductor tech, precision machining. Yeah. Like if you're going to be making like CDs, you're probably operating on a table made of this precision granite, things like that. So, so one micron? Yeah, one micron flatness. Okay. Uh, one micron, no problem, they probably make. Let's get these for the D3D base. Mm. I like oh, this. Yeah. Lots of money to have mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. Um, okay. Last, some of the last things. Cutting through very, very thick steel with very good precision, hot, not hot wire, it's called a EDM. EDM is right there. Uh, didn't cover water jet cutters, but they're very, uh, very effective, just shooting a very high, high force jet of water to pretty decent precision. There's things like hot wire cutters for styrofoam, like if you're making styrofoam for like insulation or whatever. Um, uh, thermite. I'll point out that one. That's like, what if you want to cut, um, you're an underground rebel wanting to deer a train, you use thermite. But that thermite is, uh, thermite is, it's a mixture of aluminum and something else, I forget what, but it's this crazy thing. You gotta, you gotta Google thermite, but. Then Neil told about that, like rust, pieces of rust and metal yeah, is used. It's like rust and aluminum and something else. It's very common materials, but you mix them together and they release so much energy, it will melt through anything. So if you put a little pot of that on a, on a metal beam, it will just melt it in a second. Like, it's crazy trigger, stuff. How do you trigger that? Um, I think it's just by mixing those together, and that's it. And they just start heating up in a few seconds, and they just go like... Thermite, I mean...
Thermite. This guy. Oh, that's how they. Oh, okay. So this is constructive thermite. That's how they would melt the tracks together. Um, yeah, yeah, things like that. Um, anyway, um, but for cutting regular purposes, pay attention to like tool speed, like profile of what you're cutting, thin stuff versus thick stuff. Um, if you want to cut, like if you're cutting metal, that's like abrasive cutoff is your, if it's a round thing, solid or hollow, the abrasive cutoff does not worry about thickness of the wall of the material, like t thin tubes are easy to cut. So, I mean, I think the abrasive cutoff is the most universal because if you had a higher performance thing like the cold cut metal saw or even like the, cir the metal blade on a circular saw, the, the tricky part is the clamp down part. Like the, the abrasive metal cutoff is very useful because you've got the clamp down. It's not something you gotta, gotta like clamp down some other way. So it's generally it's really good for metal cutting. That plus the iron worker plus the torch gets you just about anything you want. Um, then you've got the option to do a lot of things using reciprocating blades and circular blades on regular saws. So anything from rock to metal. Not only wood, because you'd only think like those circular saws are for wood, but they're not, but you can cut other things depending on what blade you have. So that's, like, that's about it. From the iron work, uh, well, I just think about that, the iron worker being not as accessible, right? So like in it's a heavy machine, yeah. Yeah, and what are those three tools? It's a welder, a torch, and a grinder. And with that, you could build a tractor, you could build a torch table, you can build our printer, uh, almost. But basic workshop, like MIG welder, acetylene torch, I actually put MAC drill because that's quite useful wherever the acetylene torch won't do. But, I mean, you can do anything that a MAC drill can do on a acetylene torch, it just won't be as clean. But... If you had, if you were stuck on a desert island, you had the choice of three tools. It would be a welder, a torch, and a grinder. If you're reconstructing modern civilization, because that involves metal. Those are the three kind of tools. Mac drill allows you to do big holes in places where you can't even access a drill. Say you had to drill a hole on your tractor frame can't put it like you really need a really strong vice to hold the drill you can't get your drill press on it you can't hold it by hand mag drill allows you to do that very easily actually like upside down or whatever on the right in the side of something that's why I put that in there because that's very useful but if you have a torch you can probably still get that hole in there yeah Base, that's basic workshop and then there's that's a useful page um, yep anything else I think that's it I thought that was a good discussion yeah yeah